Well, let's start this morning hearing for the government. Just a few moments ago, I spoke to the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, the Cabinet Office Minister, Oliver Dowden. The Home Secretary visited Rwanda. She said migrants could be deported there within months. Um, at the same time, though, this policy has been in action since April. No one has actually left to Rwanda yet. You'll forgive me for my scepticism. Well, the first thing I should say is, and I think I've been on your show before when you've mm -hmm. talked about these huge numbers of migrants, we're determined to grip this problem and stop the boats. Now, Rwanda forms one part of that. The reason why we haven't been able to proceed with Rwanda is because it's currently before the courts. We actually uh, succeeded at the high court stages before the Court of Appeal. But as soon as that process is through, and I'm confident our policy is lawful, we will get cracking straight away with the Rwanda policy and use that as a tool in our army. Essentially, what we're saying, and this comes through in the legislation as well that we announced earlier this month, you cannot come to this country by crossing the channel. And if you do so, you'll either be repatriated to your home country or you'll be sent to Rwanda. So it's part of that mix, but it sits alongside other things we've done. So, for example, the Albania deal, where we're seeing many flights going back to Albania already, or the work that's being done with the French. All of this is demonstration of the government gripping this problem and stopping the boats. Anyone who comes to the country on a small boat, that includes children who come with their families. Are you personally comfortable with that idea? But I don't relish any of this, and I really wish we didn't have to do it. And the government isn't running to do this. The government is doing this because this is a major problem. You're not being and I think, forced to and do I it, think, though, are you? Uh, we You're are not being, being forced we are, to do so it. We are being forced to do it. And I'll tell you why we're being forced to do it. I think with those children seeking to cross the channel, I think of the danger that their lives are being put in, the evil people smugglers in ho whose hands they're placed. And unless we are willing, as a government and as a country, to take tough action in relation to this, the numbers will keep on growing and more people's lives will be put at risk, including the lives of young children. And I'm simply not willing to allow that to happen. If this is such a great policy, then why did the Home Secretary only invite right-leading media organisations to Rwanda with her? GB News, The Sun, The Express, The Mail, on that plane, not Sky News, not the BBC, not The Eye or The Guardian. Why are you scared of scrutiny? Uh, forgive me, I don't know the details of who the Home Secretary well, invited on. I've the, just given you the, the details. The, 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 the I've the just visit. given you the details. And I've, I've heard the, visit, the, the details that uh, you've given me. The logistics of a trip are a matter for the Home Secretary, probably not even for the Home Secretary, for her, her operations team. I'm sure there'll be plenty of opportunities uh, for the BBC and for Sky to scrutinise the Home Secretary about it. And indeed, you have me uh, in front of you this morning to talk to you, and I'm de delighted to be on Sky, uh, as I always am. I do, and I'm glad you're delighted to be on the programme, but we've never had uh, the chance to scrutinise... I have never had the chance to scrutinise the Home Secretary on this. Sky, alongside others, not invited on that trip. It does look like you're running away from scrutiny. Uh, well, as I said to you, Sophie, I simply uh, don't know the details of individual operational decisions, but I'm very happy for our policy to be scrutinised because I'm confident that under Rishi Sunak, as our Prime Minister, we are gripping this problem. We're taking difficult decisions, as you rightly highlighted, but we're determined to stop this evil traffic continuing. So Ella Braverman, on this visit, visited some of the potential long-term homes for migrants in Rwanda, and she said, I really like your interior designer. I need some advice for myself. I mean, is that a bit tone deaf? We're talking here about families, children, like making a dangerous journey and being sent to Rwanda to live long term in, temp in this housing. Well, I, I think that what you can actually see, and you can see it for uh, this picture, I think she's with Nim Gurali there, but the, um, this is a, about people having a safe and secure place to go. So contrary to some of this characterisation... So not about interior some, designers, some of, uh, Contrary to some of this characterisation of the policy, this is about making sure there is somewhere safe and secure for people to go to. And actually, the purpose of the Home Secretary's visit was to further strengthen our relationships with Rwanda. So people should feel confident in this policy that, that ideally people would come to this country en, en route and they'd, get, they'd claim asylum in the first safe country they come to. They could do so in France, Belgium and so on. If they cross the, the, the channel, they can't remain here. They'll either go back to their home country or they could go to Rwanda. And you can see from that that it isn't... This is a perfectly safe and secure place for people safe, to go to. Is it safe for everyone in Rwanda? Uh, the Home Office did an equality impact assessment for the policy. 
last year, they found that there are concerns over the treatment of gay and lesbian people there and that the ill treatment is more than a one-off. Is it safe for everyone? Yes, I am confident that it is, is safe for people. And actually, the United Nations, for example, has used Rwanda as a refugee destination. And through our engagement with the Rwandan authorities and government, we are confident that people will be safe there. This is concerned by the, your own equality impact assessment. Well, I'm, of course, quality impact assessments are produced for every policy, and then it's up to ministers to consider that. Now, I'm confident the Home Secretary will have considered that, and I'm confident that because of the discussions we've had through the Rwandas, because of the fact the United Nations uh, uses Rwanda, that this is a safe place for people to go to. But in all of this, these are not easy decisions. These are difficult decisions, but they're being done for a purpose, which is to stop the boats. And we have to do this to restore control to our migration system. Um, Suella Braverman, in a recent article in the Daily Mail, uh, wrote, unless we act today, the problem will be even worse tomorrow. There are 100 million people displaced around the world and likely billions more eager to come here if possible. Billions more. Is that right? Well, it, it is a, a function of the global economy and differences in levels of development that countries like the United Kingdom, France, Germany, United States and others have potentially vast numbers of people who wish to come here as economic migrants. Billions, secondly, billions of secondly if here. you'll let me finish this point, secondly, it is the case that if you look at the numbers, we, we were at uh, a situation where there were dozens of boats three or four years ago. We're at 40,000 uh, last year, projected to rise further. We have to be willing to put a stop to this. And there are very, very large numbers of people who could potentially wish to enter the United Kingdom and indeed other developed countries uh, for, for economic migration reasons. 40,000, you, you say. So while Brahman is saying billions, come on, you know that's ridiculous. Well, I think you know that's ludicrous. I, I, Sophie, I think you're you're sort of you're taking two things slightly out, out of context. So what she's making the, the she's making the point, which is perfectly correct, which is that these numbers are increasing very very rapidly. That is and not the point if, she's and making. And if we don't take action, the the numbers could increase and increase and increase again. And the potential pool of people, which I think is what she's referring to with the, the billions, is the fact that if you look at a, a global population of, I think, of about 8 billion people, many billions of those people are not in economically developed countries like our own, so could potentially wish to migrate for economic reasons. And I think that, that's the, the argument she's making. I mean, Gary Lineker likens this kind of language to that used in 1930s Germany. Well, I think that's deeply offensive. And as somebody who represents... Uh, a community with a very large number of, of Jewish uh, people in it. The, the, the comparison between policies by this government to legitimately stop dangerous illegal migration and the evils of the Nazi regime, I find it appalling that people could draw parallels between the two of them and deeply offensive. Uh, right, we need to move on to other uh, issues uh, now. You're announcing an emergency alert system that will come to people's mobile devices. Just explain what the idea is here. So the idea of this is that in a situation where there is a serious risk to life, people will receive an alert on their phone. It's basically just broadcast from mobile phone masks and can be reduced to a ward level. And you only receive that in the most serious of circumstances and it will warn you about action that you need to take. This is one tool in the toolkit that the government has to deal with the most serious situations. And it could be that that alert could save your life. Now, I don't expect this to be used very often. In fact, I hope it, it isn't used at all. But as part of our preparedness for it, we will be having a trial in about a month's time on the 23rd of April. So everyone will hear their phone buzz. It's quite a loud siren for about 10 seconds. There's no need for anyone to, to do anything. Uh, but that's just a test to make sure that it can reach everyone's phone. And this capability can reach up to 90% of people. So it's an important tool to help us deal with civil resilience. What kind of scenarios do you expect it to be used in? Well, I, th I think it will only be used in very uh, serious situations where there is a significant risk to life. So I would think for most people, they wouldn't expect to hear this buzz possibly not ever or certainly not for a, a few years. It broadly replicates what happens in other countries. So, for example, the United States, Japan, 
the Netherlands. And, and really so where it would be, it would be for things like natural disasters, potentially terrorist incidents. Is that correct? It, or? Yes, but it, it would depend on the individual circumstances. So take an example, for example, if there's a, a very severe flooding situation where your home is at risk of being uh, inundated and your life could be in danger if you remove, remain in your home, in that area you will re receive an alert. In respect of terror incidents, it will depend on the operational advice that we receive from the counter-terror police and others, because clearly it will depend on the circumstances. It may well not be appropriate to have a loud alert in, in some situations. Uh, in, in others, it could be the case that a warning is required for people. Um, now, lots of our viewers this morning, the one thing they're going to want to know more than any other thing is what is going on with public sector strikes. Now, the government's in talks with the teaching unions and also junior doctors, I believe. Can you tell us what's going on? Well, first of all, uh, in respect to what's called the agenda for, mm. for change, mm. so that covers nurses, mm. ambulance workers and so on, we made good progress. We've, we've reached what I believe is a fair deal and that will go to their memberships and I hope their memberships will, will accept that. In respect of the teachers, uh, those discussions are ongoing with the Education Secretary. In respect of the junior doctors, our door remains open for uh, those discussions and we've had some uh, initial contact with them, but, but formal negotiations are, are not ongoing. But I would very much hope that those can happen and that we can get to a situation where we have a, a decent a pay deal for public sector workers, but one that respects our public finances and respects the pressure on inflation. And I think that that's what we've got to with the Agenda for Change workforce, and I hope it's where we could get to elsewhere. Are you optimistic with the teaching talks? Because obviously lots of parents have seen a lot of disruption with schools closing. Yes, no, indeed, I, I've seen that um, disruption myself, and I very much hope that uh, we can get to a situation where it's uh, resolved. We will just have to wait and see okay. how those negotiations go. I really don't want to be out them one way or the other. Uh, you do talk about the Agenda for Change uh, group, however. Um, there has been a breakthrough, obviously, that's going to go to the membership with a 5% pay rise for nurses plus a one-off payment this year. There is a bit of concern about how this is going to be funded, though. Um, if you look at the submission of evidence from the Department for Health, uh, this was to the independent pay review body this year, they said funding is available for pay awards up to 3.5%. Pay awards above this level would require trade-offs for public service delivery or further government borrowing. Obviously, the pay award we're talking about here is 5%. Yeah. So are these trade-offs going to happen in elsewhere in the NHS budget? Uh, well, as you say, first of all, there's 3.5% there's, there's uh, already there, so it's, it's the remaining amount. This is fairly standard practice for, for reaching additional public uh, expenditure requirements. The NHS has a budget of uh, 100, well, got to £160 billion. Pounds. We're clear that we won't uh, affect frontline services by doing this, so there won't be any cuts to NHS services. It will have to be delivered through efficiency or, or from wider savings across government. It is perfectly normal to work through that process, but mm. indeed it does illustrate the challenges of all this. Finding this money is not easy, but we think that in this context of ensuring that uh, we reward nurses okay. properly, and we prevent disruption that, that we can find the money to do this, but it won't be easy. I mean, you, so it's existing budgets, effectively. The House Secretary on Thursday said it won't come from areas of the budget that impact on patients. I, I'll be honest, I really find this very hard to get my head around. Can you explain what areas of the NHS budget doesn't impact patients? Well, I, I would say two things. So, first of all, it doesn't necessarily have to come uh, within the uh, the envelope for the, the NHS of the £160 billion. There's the wider Department of Health budget and there's the wider budget across all of government. And it's usual to work through with the Treasury to find so where those efficiencies can be... The wider budget, all of government? Can I'm be just trying to... Cause, cause so, if you just let, let me, me finish yeah. on this... Um, on, on this point, but even within the £160 billion for the NHS, not all of that is going to be for frontline uh, services. So, the frontline services we think about are... Of course, your hospitals, your doctors' surgeries, and so on. Within a budget that large, the, it is there is potential to get efficiencies. What I would my, say is that my, in all of this, just it's, it's a fairly in, routine practice. Yes, it, of course. because it uh, does feel yeah. right. My, my point is that yeah. anywhere in the Department for Health, if you're talking about, for example, social care, that does have an impact on patient care as well. We know the link between social care and the NHS. We talk about efficiency savings. Well, anyone who tries to get an appointment and realizes the lengthy process it takes to, takes admin in the NHS also impacts patients. It feels quite disingenuous to me to say that it won't impact patient care. 
Well, given the pressure that um, health services around the world are, are under, we're not going to uh, take services away from the, the front line. I don't deny for a minute, Sophie, your point, which is that it is challenging to find this money. This is why the government um, held out for so long in respect of these negotiations, because there wasn't some huge amount of money that we could turn to. But I am confident that we, we can find it uh, either within the NHS budgets or wider government uh, spending. OK. Now, next week on Wednesday, we're going to have a vote on the Brexit deal, the so-called Windsor framework. Are you optimistic the DUP are going to come on board? Well, look, that's, that's a matter for, the, uh, for the, the DUP. I hope that they will come on board, but I, I really don't want to preempt decisions that, that they're going to make. But I think what you, you have seen, and indeed you've seen this with the Windsor Agreement, many other things that this government does, has done, we are getting a grip of challenges facing this country. Many people said it wouldn't be possible to achieve the kind of treaty changes we've achieved to ensure that there is effectively no border for goods east-west between uh, mainland Great Britain and uh, the rest of the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland. That, in turn, those actions by the Prime Minister have commanded widespread support across different political parties and across the Conservative Party. So I'm confident that the vote will uh, succeed and pass, and I hope we will do so with the support of the DUP, but ultimately that is for them. Uh, now, next week, let's be honest, on Wednesday, it may all be completely overshadowed by the Boris Johnson show because he is going to be in front of the Privileges Committee investigating whether or not he misled Parliament over Partygate. Now, according to the Sunday Telegraph, his team are preparing to unveil bombshell evidence to exonerate him that will show, in their words, he was advised to say what went on, what he went on and said. I mean, it sounds a little bit like he's preparing to throw his aides under the bus. Well, I'm, I'm sure that, first of all, I should say this is a matter for the, the House authorities and for the relevant uh, committee and... Uh, it's not really for ministers to give running commentaries on these things, but I'm sure uh, Boris Johnson will give a, a robust defence of himself and then it will be for the committee to, to determine the outcome of it. It's not helpful, is it, though? Well, this, this is a process that was initiated by the House of Commons. And, of course, the House of Commons is entirely at, at liberty to, to make whatever decisions it, it wants to. I'm sure the uh, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson will provide a, a robust defence, and it will be then up to the, the, the committee to make their determination. Rishi Sunak, um, according to reports, is going to offer Conservative MPs a free vote uh, if the Privileges Committee finds against Boris Johnson. It, would that be the right thing to do? Well, the standard practice in on what we call House matters, so matters that are being led by the, the, the House of Commons that, that relate to these sort of things, it, it is standard practice not to whip the vote. Um, I don't, I'm not sure final decisions have been made, but that would be the precedent that, that you would expect to follow. That's not going to really help uh, allies of Boris Johnson, right? Uh, well, it, it's a fairly well-established uh, principle that uh, we don't interfere in, in house business. But as I said, I'm, I'm sure that Boris Johnson will provide a, a robust defence and it will be for the, the committee to make its determination. And then just finally, you're obviously close to Rishi Sunak. I think you'd probably describe yourself as a friend. How would you describe his feelings towards Boris Johnson? I think, actually, he has a, a lot of respect for Boris Johnson. Indeed, I think any Prime Minister, and I've seen this with... Uh, I've had the privilege of knowing a number of Prime Ministers, when they become Prime Minister, they realise quite how demanding the job of being Prime Minister is and have respect for all of their predecessors. And, and he has that respect for Boris Johnson as well. OK. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, that was Oliver Dowden uh, speaking to us a little earlier. Well, let's get Labour's view now. We can speak to the party shadow levelling up secretary, Lisa Nandy, who is in Salford. Good to uh, speak to you today, uh, Lisa Nandy. We just heard from Oliver Dowden talking about the government's policy on Rwanda. He said he doesn't relish any of it, but the government is being forced to do it because of the increasing number of small boats crossing the channel. Is that fair enough? Well, forced to do what? Everyone accepts that this is a major problem, it's a crisis. We've got record number of boats arriving on the coast, uh, criminal gangs profiting and um, an asylum system in chaos. But the question is, what is the government actually doing? So far, they've done several PR opportunities and photo ops. We've had £140 million of cheques written to Rwanda in order to implement a scheme that hasn't removed a single person. This is just more stunts from this government. What they should be doing is what Labour's been calling for for a very long time. Take the money that is being spent on this unethical 
practical, unworkable scheme and put it into the National Crime Agency to create a cross-border cell in order to disrupt the criminal gangs who are profiting from people's misery. That would be the best way to stop the small boats and back it up with proper resources at the front end of the asylum system so that we can process cases swiftly and get a grip on what has become an unwieldy system that is completely out of control. You know what, that would be the best thing to do if we were living in a perfect world. But the fact is we're really not. If it was that easy to stop the smuggling gangs, you'd see other countries in the world doing it. You know, Interpol themselves are saying how difficult it is. It's, they're not like usual organised crime because of the transient nature of their relationships with their victims. You know, they burn of phones, they often don't know their real names. You know, Labour could say that it wants to wave a magic wand and just smash the smuggling gangs, but that's not a serious solution. I don't think that diverting resources into setting up a specialist national crime agency cell is waving a magic wand. What it's doing is the hard yards that this government hasn't been prepared to do to tackle what is a very challenging criminal problem that is exploiting some of the most desperate people in the world. People who will, uh, are fleeing war, who are fleeing persecution, are relieving such desperate circumstances that unless we do roll up our sleeves and do the hard yards to deal with the problem at source, the conditions that they're fleeing, to deal with an asylum system that leaves people languishing for months and often years waiting for a decision, to deal with criminal gangs who have ruthlessly exploited the fact that this government has refused to get a grip on the problem, has refused to work constructively with other countries in order to do so. Unless we do that, we're going to see what we've seen for the last decade, which is this problem continue to get worse and worse. The bill is going up, the waiting times are going up, the number of boats are going up. Since the Prime Minister said he was going to get a grip on this and legislate to stop it last year, we've seen the number of boat crossings reach record highs, 45,000 last year. The government continues to make promises, big talk and photo opportunities, but what we're calling for is precisely the action that you talked about, Sophie, not a magic wand, not a silver bullet, but real work um, to, to, to tackle these gangs, to tackle this problem and to make sure that where we do offer people sanctuary, we can do so swiftly and humanely and restore Britain's reputation in the world again. Um, I also put some of Suella Braverman's language to Oliver Dowden, saying that it's the kind of language that Gary Lineker likened to that used in 1930s Germany. He said that that was an appalling comparison uh, by the Match of the Day presenter. Is it? Well, look, I think what people say Gary Lineker said is very different from what Gary Lineker actually said. The government has been keen to say that he was likening this to the Nazis, that he wasn't, and I would have utterly condemned that had he done so. I don't think he would have done so, frankly. What he was pointing to was a chilling comparison uh, with an environment in which people aren't free to be able to challenge this sort of language and behaviour. Don't forget it was Suella Braverman who used really inhumane language about the migrant crisis, which was roundly condemned, not just by people outside of politics, but by people across the political spectrum, including some of her own colleagues. All of this comes back to the same problem, that the government's policies, their answers and solutions, their language is getting increasingly more outlandish because they're not prepared to do the work to actually disrupt the criminal gangs, to speed up the asylum process and to work with other countries to deal with the problems that refugees are fleeing, which is creating instability around the world. Now, Rishi Sunak came to office saying that he was going to start focusing down on cleaning up some of his own mess. This is one area where we need far less posturing, far less dangerous talk and far more real action to deal with what has been a real problem and Labour has been saying so for a very long time. Um, I want to talk to you about Brexit because of course there will be the vote next week on the uh, Windsor framework. Oliver Dowden says he's confident that will pass, not least of course because Labour is expected to back it. Do you think it's a good deal for Northern Ireland? Look, I think it's, it's a step forward and we will support a step forward. As I said a moment ago, Rishi Sunak is prepared to go and start cleaning up some of his own mess. We're certainly not going to criticise him for that. And there's no question that this is something that is now urgent. It's incredibly important. And trying to remove some of that friction, some of those barriers on the island of Ireland has long been 
our priority. We think the government ought to get on with it. We hope that vote passes. And we hope that Britain can now start to look to the future after 13 long years of drift and decay under this Tory government. This was budget week. This should have been the moment where Britain got onto the front foot and started leading the world, not leaving it. Started winning the race for good jobs to get money back into people's pockets. Started prioritising most people in most parts of the country, not just a handful of the wealthiest in a few parts of the country and instead here we still are talking about the Tory failures of the past and how we're going to fix them we just think Britain could do so much better than this. Talking about how you think Britain should do better um, you of course are the shadow levelling up secretary you want to see more devolu devolution now that sounds great of course uh, giving more power to local communities across the country but I just wonder in practice you know if you look at what is happening in local authorities, in councils, Croydon's gone bust, Woking, Slough, Thurrock, Warrington, just a few in financial difficulties. You know, anyone who's had any dealings with their actual local council might be thinking, hang on, you want them to do more? Well, actually, the pandemic paints a very different story. When the national system just couldn't respond, the government reluctantly handed over the right to run test, trace and isolate systems and other uh, wrote the rollout of the vaccine to local authorities, to public health directors um, and to communities. And we responded. We stepped forward and ran effective systems in every part of the country, including Greater Manchester, where I'm sitting now, when the national system just simply couldn't do it because we know our own communities we know the assets and the potential that exists in those communities not just the problems that Whitehall is keen to focus on and we were able to mobilize people in order to get the vaccine rolled out in record time and to get test trace and isolate up and running 13 years of Tory government has meant that councils are reeling. They've had uh, 15 billion cut from their budgets over that time. And in this budget, buried in the detail of this budget, was a six billion pound council tax bombshell. Essentially, the government is forcing councils to put up council tax in order to fund the services that currently exist because the national government has stepped out of the picture. But we believe that this country could do far, far better if we actually trusted our local businesses and our local communities to take charge of their own destiny. The government says that they're in favour of doing that, but in this week's budget, which should have been a game changer, they introduced devolution deals that cover just 9% of the population. What about the missing 90% of us? We deserve far better than to be treated by this government as second-class citizens on a second-class track to be able to unshackle ourselves from 13 years of Tory failure and start to grow our economies and get money back into people's pockets again. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed, Lisa and Andy there, uh, speaking to us from South Thank you. Well, you're watching Safety Ridge uh, on Sunday. Uh, we've done a lot uh, on the immigration debate so far, strong views on either side of the argument, plus still to come on the programme this morning. In just a moment, we'll be talking to the German ambassador to the UK, Miguel Berger. And a little uh, later on, we're going to be hearing from the third of our SNP leadership candidate interviews. This time, it will be Kate Forbes. Plus, we are going to get some immediate reaction from our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, who's been watching all of the interviews intently for us this morning. We'll speak to Sam a little bit later on. Right, let's crack on, shall we, with our next uh, interview, because relationships between the EU and the UK are certainly a lot warmer, uh, shall we say, uh, with Rishi Sunak uh, in charge. So I'm very pleased to say that our next guest uh, joins us now uh, on the programme. Uh, that is the ambassador, German ambassador to the UK, Miguel Berger. Thank you so much for being with us on the programme. Um, lots to talk to you about. Brexit, Ukraine. But first, if I may, I want to talk to you about mm. immigration to start, um, because the UK government is really focusing on trying to stop desperate people making the channel crossings. But of course, this isn't an issue just for the UK. Asylum seekers are an issue for many European countries as well. Rishi Sunak has promised to stop the boats. Is that even possible? <clears throat> Very difficult to say it, if it will be possible, but um, I agree that it's a wider problem. It's not only what is happening in the channel. I think we have to look at migration routes from Libya, from Turkey, from Tunisia, from many other countries. We have climate change, which is producing more refugees. 
So in the end, I think what we will need is a stronger international cooperation to cope with this problem. I just want to have a look at some figures, if I may, uh, because I think if we look at the graphic that I'm about to show you, Germany is clearly more uh, asylum seekers than the UK. You can see the UK there in red. This is the number of asylum applications per 100,000 people. Uh, Germany all the way up there with 178, the UK down at 87. How much of an issue is it in Germany? It is an issue because we have more than one million refugees who came from Ukraine. Mm. So that is already a heavy burden, plus all the others from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. So we are also in a debate about what to do and how to distribute the burden. But the difference is that in Germany, asylum and to claim asylum is a constitutional right. Mm. And uh, so everybody who comes legally or illegally can claim asylum and will be listened to. That's interesting because obviously in the UK, there's a very clear distinction between people who come through the legal routes for the schemes with Ukraine, for example, and people who enter on uh, small boats. Um, many people think the only way to actually stop the boats is to sign a returns agreement so that they can be sent back to France. But obviously that would mean not signing a returns agreement with France, but with the EU. Do you think that's something that the EU would consider? I'm not sure that the EU will consider that, but the better way, I think, uh, is to talk to countries of origin like Albania. Because in Germany, we also, I think, only accept less than 1% of Albanians as real asylum seekers. Mm. The majority comes for economic reasons. So we have an agreement to return them to their country of origin. And I think this is the way to go. But let me really clearly say, Sophie, that for us, I think the important thing is to respect international law. And that means the, the Geneva Refugee Convention and the European Convention for Human Rights. Do you think that the UK is respecting international law then? I've seen that the Prime Minister made a statement at the French-British summit where he clearly stated that the United Kingdom is going to respect international law. OK. Um, let's move on to uh, Ukraine, uh, shall we? Um, the International Criminal Court has issued an arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin. Is that news that you welcome? It's definitely a very important moment for international law, for the international... Uh, criminal justice, uh, because it means really accountability at the highest level. And uh, so, yes, we welcome it. Uh, and on Monday, we are going to have here in London a conference. Dominic Raab has invited justice ministers from all over Europe to discuss how we can strengthen the work of the International Criminal Court. And I think it sends a very clear signal also to everybody in Russia about what can happen if they are part of crimes against humanity. Do you think it sends an important message to other global leaders as well? Vladimir Putin's due to be meeting the Chinese president, for example. Do you think it will perhaps send a bit of a signal to countries who are perhaps not recognising Putin's crimes? It, yes, definitely. And we have 123 countries who are part of the International Criminal Court. And for all of them, it will always be a question, can you still talk and receive somebody like Putin? And there is an international arrest warrant. Um, so all of that will limit Putin's possibilities. But Sophie, let me also say that we have to look also at the political fallout of that, because what does it mean? Will this mean that Russia's position on the war will harden even more? So there are many, many implications which need to be taken into account. And you think there is a risk of that? There is a risk of that, but at the same time, I think within the Putin administration, many people will have now second thoughts about their participation in this, in this crime of aggression, in this war. Um, now, let's talk a bit about weapons, because Poland and Slovakia have decided to send fighter jets to Ukraine. Do you think Germany would consider doing that in the future? Um, we don't have the F-16s um, Ukraine has requested, but nevertheless, I think it's a very important move by Poland and Slovakia to do that. We are currently putting together a big international alliance to send the Leopard tanks. Mm. So we are building up uh, more than two battalions, tank battalions. Training has just finished. And I would expect the Leopard to arrive uh, as soon as possible in Ukraine. Germany, for obvious historical reasons, has a reluctance to send armaments, to be dragged into conflicts. How much of a journey would you say that your country has been on in the last year with the war in Ukraine? 
Yeah, it was a fundamental change mm -hmm. of our policy, not only on arms delivery, but also towards Russia. But I mean, the fact that we are now leading this coalition to send a large amount of tanks to maintain them, to uh, procure the artillery, the ammunition, the logistics, I think all of that shows that Germany is now really in a leading position on supporting Ukraine. On the military side, we are more or less at the same level as the United Kingdom. But if you take everything together, we are, I would say, the second support of Ukraine internationally. Do you think you're a bit slow off the mark initially? It was a more difficult discussion in Germany. Mm. Uh, that's something very clearly. And we had um, to totally uh, restructure our Russia policy. That's why it took a little bit longer than in other countries. And is that because of the energy dependence on Russia in particular? Or? No, I think it had more to do with um, the historic relationship. We mm. should not forget that the Soviet Union was part of mm. uh, achieving German reunification, that we all tried to build up uh, a system in Europe where we could include Russia in, a, mm. in, a, in an international security architecture. And regrettably, that has failed. Now we have to learn our lessons from them. It's interesting to hear you talk about that um, so openly. Uh, now, I want to talk a bit about Brexit because, of course, we have the yes. votes in the House of Commons on Wednesday on the Windsor Framework. What is your message to Conservative MPs, to DUP MPs, unions to MPs from Northern Ireland who might be looking at this and thinking, I can't support this? Yeah, I, th I think it's a very good compromise that has been worked out quietly over four months between the European Commission and the British government. Uh, it's a compromise, like always. It preserves the Good Friday Agreement. It preserves East-West trade. It means that the, that the border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland can stay open. So I think it achieves all the main objectives. And what I hear very often from business people in Northern Ireland is what they need is predictability and stability. And I think the Windsor framework can achieve that. I guess if from the unionist perspective in Northern Ireland, their priority is being treated like the rest of the UK, so that they're treated in exactly the same way as Glasgow, as Nottingham, as London. And for them, that doesn't achieve it. Do you think that people in the EU really understand the depth of feeling from the DUP and others? Yes, I think we, we do that and the Commission has reached out. I myself have met several times Jeffrey Donaldson. Obviously, we understand the sensitivities of the DUP and other unionists. But at the same time, I think we need a compromise which allows us to have the necessary confidence in the agreement. And I think this has been achieved. So, Sophie, let me say that we are very confident not only that there will be an overwhelming majority in the House of Commons, but also that this is an agreement where we can build on to strengthen the relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union. How different has it been for the EU and for Germany and others uh, dealing with Rishi Sunak as opposed to Boris Johnson and this trust? I think that with Prime Minister Sunak and especially the relationship he has developed with the President of the European Commission, Ms. von der Leyen, is a relationship of trust. And this is something we can build on. So we have full confidence that the British government is really going to implement what was agreed. And as we know, that was not the case with Boris Johnson. How would you describe the relationship with Boris Johnson? I would say that the relationship was really at a, at a very low point. There was no trust that things that are agreed will be implemented, and this is absolutely different now. So I think we can look into a, a brighter future in the relationship between the United Kingdom and, and the European Union. OK, thank you very much for coming on the programme. Thank, thank you. you, Sophie. Well, as usual, uh, the take will follow this programme just after 9.30. Our chance to analyse today's interviews, talk through any news lines uh, with our Deputy Political Editor to Sam Coates. But we can get a quick take from him now on what stood out to him this morning. Uh, Sam, it feels like the big story around today has been the Rwanda deal uh, and uh, that visit by Suella uh, Braverman. Uh, is that what's really stood out on the programme or is there anything else you want to pick out? 
So I think Rishi Sunak has probably had the best three or so weeks of his time as prime minister. But whether it's talking about the Rwanda policy or the other issues that have cropped up on the programme this morning, it's just clear how difficult things still are for him, whether it's Rwanda. I'm reminded that the biggest opponent out there isn't Gary Lineker, but Theresa May, the former Home Secretary and Prime Minister, who's opposing that deal on grounds of it gets rid of her modern slavery uh, uh, changes. Uh, and she just doesn't think it deals with the main issue, which is overstayers. An extraordinary uh, admission from Oliver Dowden on the programme as well, that funding that NHS pay deal, £1.5 billion, has got to be found for that. Well, that's got to come potentially from the NHS budget, not the frontline bits. But that means maybe scrapping headcount. Uh, it means maybe scaling back on digital transformation problems. Uh, the Institute for Fiscal Studies said on Friday that could mean, uh, effectively, the NHS wobbles along and then needs a bailout out in a few months' time. Then there's Brexit and there's Boris Johnson. The to-do list is still very full after listening to this morning's interviews. Yeah, it certainly is. It's one of those interviews where it's like, right, there is so much that I could ask you about. I'm going to have to whittle this down. Uh, Sam, thank you very much uh, indeed. We'll have more from Sam uh, at around half past nine. Now to the SNP leadership race to replace Nicola Sturgeon. It's our third and final interview of the three candidates to take that job. Now, Kate Forbes doesn't do interviews on Sundays for religious reasons. Usually it would be no big deal to pre-record an interview with a politician. But when it comes to the SNP, it turns out that two days really is an awfully long time in politics because since her interview, the head of communications quit after unwittingly giving out false information about SNP membership numbers. And now the party's chief executive, Peter Murrell, has also resigned after taking responsibility for the fiasco. Now, Mr Murrell, by the way, also happens to be Nicola Sturgeon's husband. So that's all worth bearing in mind when you listen to this interview with Kate Forbes. We started by talking about independence. I think that's the democratic uh, approach. I think too much in our political debate right now is vitriolic, it's abusive, it's disrespectful. And actually, when it comes to the SNP, if we want to win independence, it comes down to respecting our fellow citizens and the reasons why they haven't yet been persuaded. I think many in the SNP are surprised that there hasn't been a more substantial shift of support for independence, not least when we've seen a Conservative government attack devolution, we're in the throes of a Tory cost of living crisis and so on. And I think for me as leader, it's about reaching out beyond the divide, reaching out to people who uh, haven't yet been persuaded and making the case for how Scotland can be wealthier and fairer. You know, in the, in the context of a leadership contest, it's easy to forget that there's a lot more than, that unites us than divides us, not least wanting to eradicate poverty, wanting to see a growing prosperous economy, wanting to ensure that people aren't fuel poor. I think the path to that is good governance and ultimately putting the powers around Scotland's future into the hands of those in Scotland. I talked about good governance. Um, you wrote a joint letter with Ash Regan uh, calling for information about the current membership status of the SNP. What exactly are your concerns about this process? Well, I have no concerns about the process, so I have full confidence in, in the integrity of the election contest. All three candidates, in fact, were asking for SNP membership figures because it stands to reason that in any election, the candidates should know the size of the electorate, the size of the, uh, the group of people that they are trying to persuade. Um, and I'm very relieved that those figures have now been confirmed. But I think those figures demonstrate that continuity won't cut it. My my whole pitch has been around building on the SNP's track record, but re-earning the trust of our SNP voters as well as the wider public. And the fact that we've lost so many members in such a short period of time, I think, demonstrates that we do need to shift focus and deliver change. Continuity won't cut it. Who is the continuity candidate? Well, I think if you were to ask uh, the other candidates, um, at least one has a uh, quite happily and readily accepted that he is the, the continuity candidate. And I have great respect for his approach, but ultimately there is a profound choice facing SNP 
members because I offer a, a new approach. I want to put our economy front and centre. I want to reach out to no voters, as I've already said. And I want to ensure that we eradicate poverty and rebuild the strength of the trust that we enjoy with the Scottish people. That's how the SNP has won multiple elections over the last 16 years. And if we want to continue to win elections, then I believe that we are at a crossroads and we need to take the approach that will ultimately ensure we maintain that trust going forward. So you say that you've got confidence in the process. Ash Regan told me last week, who's obviously another of the candidates, that she thinks that there's a conflict of interest with Nicola Sturgeon's husband remaining as SNP chief executive while the contest is ongoing. Do you agree with that? No, I don't, because I think that uh, we have, obviously, the, the third party electronic provider of voting um, and also because I have full confidence in the process. Ultimately, this will be determined by SNP members. And I think there would be outrage from the SNP members if there was any perception of a, a lack of integrity. So I think steps have been taken in order to uh, ensure the integrity of the process. Uh, and I'm certainly confident that whoever is elected will be the person who SNP members have chosen. Now, after her resignation, uh, Nicola Sturgeon said, Scotland is a progressive country and the views of the next First Minister therefore matter. Do you consider yourself to have progressive views? I do, indeed. I think we live in a pluralistic, tolerant society which allows space for everyone. And of course, the definition of progressivity is that we stand up for those who have no voice and ensure that we are representing their interest. In Scotland today, there are extraordinarily deep social economic inequalities with one in four children in poverty, with the life expectancy between those in the most deprived and the least deprived areas far too wide. And I focused during my campaign in not just meeting with those who perhaps have a vote, but meeting, for example, with women from ethnic minority groups who have gone through the asylum seeker process and who truly have no uh, voice and, and Ukrainian refugees. So I think Scotland has made great strides. We need to be a welcoming, tolerant country. And my hope is that there's place for everyone. The Scottish Government have committed, committed by the end of the year to have ended gay and trans conversion therapy. Now, in the debate on Monday night on Sky News, our political editor Beth Rigby asked you six times if you would ban conversion therapy, even if the individual consented. Um, you didn't exactly give a straight answer to that. Now you've had a bit of time to think. What is the position on that? Yeah, so I said in that debate, and I'll say again today, that conversion therapy is abhorrent. Uh, we've been through a process where many people have shared their lived experiences. And on a hugely sensitive issue like this, I think it's important that it's those lived experiences that inform the approach that we take to the debate. Now, I understand that there are people who will say that there's no non-coercive approach to conversion therapy. And I certainly, you know, I'm, I'm not here to, 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 to argue with that. I'm here to build on the experiences that people have shared and ensure that any approach we take to the legislation, it reflects uh, those lived experiences. But it is a very, very sensitive issue. And I do think it's important that rather than give you sort of quick, sort of gotcha answers um, on a matter of such importance, that we do reflect on the consultation responses and we ensure the legislation uh, bans such an abhorrent practice. Um, now, just finally, there are three people in the race, but really it's kind of two horses at the front, yourself and Hamza Yousaf. Do you think he'd make a good First Minister? I think he would, yes. I do think, I think he has great talents. I think he's got an ability to connect with anybody, to, to, to reach people. He has obviously been one of my colleagues for many years and I've seen him in action. And I think that right now the people of the SNP have a genuine choice to make. And what I offer is change, building on our track record, bringing a level of competence and a track record to my approach and ensuring that we do deliver economic prosperity as a means of eradicating poverty. Would you serve in his cabinet if you're asked? Well, it's, it's somewhat presumptuous to assume I will be asked, um, but certainly um, I'd be happy uh, to serve with him or to serve under him. Thank you very much indeed, Kate Forbes. Thank you.
Uh, Kate Forbes uh, there talking to me a little bit earlier this week. We're going to have more on the SNP fiasco, implosion, difficulties, whatever you uh, describe, like to describe it, when we have a bit of a panel uh, chat later on the programme uh, with Samar Shah and Aisha Hazarika, uh, two former government advisers. So that should be uh, interesting to see their take. Now, the strikes that have plagued the public sector for months, from the health service to schools, trains and more, seem to have an end in sight. It was started by nursing unions accepting a new offer this week to pitch their members. Now, teachers and others are in intensive talks, but there are lots of disputes remaining, including thousands of civil servants. And many of those are members of the PCS union. We can now speak to its general secretary, Mark Sawatka. Uh, thank you for being on the programme. Can you just outline exactly what your members are asking for? Uh, good morning, Sophie. Uh, yes, I represent uh, civil service workers um, from the most junior grades uh, up to more senior levels across 250 different government departments. Uh, we've had the lowest pay increase anywhere in the public sector. The government's given its own workforce 2%. We have 40,000 civil servants using food banks. Incredibly, 45,000 civil servants claim in-work benefits, the benefits they themselves administer. And it's now been revealed in just two government departments, HMRC and DWP, 49,000 staff, Sophie, are on the national minimum wage. People who chase tax dodgers, pay benefits, make decisions on asylum claims. So we've asked for a 10% pay rise because inflation has averaged a 10%. Food inflation actually was 16% last week for the staple goods our members are struggling to buy. And I have to say, I find it extraordinary that the Minister for the Cabinet Office that you interviewed earlier on did not even mention that 135,000 of his staff were on strike earlier this week, 110,000 of his staff were on strike on the 1st of February, and he's gonna have 1,500 of his staff in every passport office in the UK out for a five week strike starting in two weeks time. I think it goes to confirm the utter contempt they hold their own workforce in, and that's why we're on strike. A five week strike by members of the passport office, five weeks. I mean, that doesn't sound like a strike, it sounds like a sabbatical. It sounds like people giving everything they can to strain every sinew to force their employer to recognise that when they go into food banks and claiming benefits, because they work for the government, it is obscene. And we've tried for months to get the government to engage. It's great news they're talking to the health unions and the education unions, but why won't they talk to their own workforce? Richie Sunak applauded his workforce during the pandemic. He lauded us for delivering the furlough scheme, for delivering three million claims to universal credit. Many people died in the civil service who went into work to keep our borders safe and provide frontline services. Yet a 2% pay rise is lower than anywhere in the economy and they will not even negotiate with us. And I think most of your viewers would find that utterly astonishing. And that's why people are having to take escalating strike action because they have no choice if they want to get themselves out of in-work poverty. Um, you say that you want to see a 10% pay rise for your members. Um, the nurses, of course, accepted a one-off payment for this year and a pay rise of 5% from next year. Is that the kind of offer that you would consider? Well, the health service, of course, in effect, have had a 6% pay rise for 2022 and a 5% pay rise for 2023. Firefighters had a 7% pay rise last year, 5% this year. Teachers are in talks. We're saying to the government, if you call us in with money on the table, we are prepared to negotiate with you. But those negotiations must ensure that their workforce are not poorer at the end of the year than they were at the start of the year. And that's currently what we face. And that's why I repeat the point, why can't even the minister responsible on your show find it within himself to acknowledge that he's had unprecedented strikes amongst government workers, and yet he's not even prepared to talk to them. And I personally think that's an utter scandal. And that's why passport workers are going on strike for five weeks. But not just passport workers, there'll be workers in the British Library, in the Department of Work and Pensions, in the tax offices, in the borders, across every government department, unless they do the thing that they know they have to, but so far seem reluctant to, which is get into negotiations with money on the table. 
Uh, now, while I have you, as you obviously represent many workers in the civil service, I just want to talk to you about Dominic Raab, who, of course, uh, is facing allegations uh, of alleged bullying. He denies it is currently being looked into. Now, on the programme a few weeks ago, he said he would resign if a bullying complaint against him was upheld. But he did also say uh, that it wouldn't be right for him to be suspended or to step aside while complaints are being investigated, because, in his words, it meant civil servants or others could knock out a cabinet minister for political or malicious reasons. Do you think that's a fair point? No, I don't. Um, what's malicious is bullying in the workplace. And whilst Dominic Raab is going through a process, we know that Priti Patel was found to have bullied civil servants in the Home Office, yet she got away with hardly a sanction. We know that Suella Braverman broke the ministerial code, yet now she issues emails accusing her own workforce of blocking her Rwanda policy. And we have Dominic Raab with not but one complaint but numerous complaints. And the point I would make is if one of my members, Sophie, had an allegation like this against them, they would be suspended. In fact, we have had members who have been dismissed for just doing a tweet or a social media post that doesn't cause offence to anyone, let alone allegations of, of bullying in the workplace. So he should step aside or he should be suspended while the allegations are investigated. And it's time, I think, that the government realised the way they are being seen to treat their own workforce causes a collapse of morale and causes people to really question whether they can play a role in public service when they're not only treated like this by ministers, but are then scapegoated by ministers as soon as something goes wrong. Um, important, of course, to say Donald Raab denies the allegations, the report is ongoing. It will be the Prime Minister who ultimately decides. Is that acceptable as well? No, I don't think it is, because I think we've already seen two examples with very high-profile ministers, whether that's Priti Patel or Suella Braverman, found to have breached the ministerial code, and yet nothing seemed to have been done about it. And therefore, that brings into question whether indeed the Prime Minister himself doesn't act, acts impartially, because it seems the Prime Minister can, can turn a blind eye for their political colleagues. I don't think anybody could have trust in that process because ultimately, even when you're found to have done something wrong, it seems that you can still survive without any sanction. Uh, OK, thank you very much. Really interesting to talk uh, this morning. Mark Sawatka speaking to us there from West Wales. Thank you. Well, it's been an absolutely packed show. So we're going to try out something a little bit different on the programme today that I'm really looking forward to. Um, because of all of the stuff on the programme and also a busy week coming up, we decided we are going to you know, kick our heels off. We're going to have a bit of a more relaxed conversation uh, with two ladies uh, that I'm going to introduce you to now because they certainly know their way around Westminster. Former political advisor to the Labour leader Ed Miliband, Aisha Hazarika and Sama Shah, who was a special advisor to the Conservative Home Secretary Sajid Javid. Thank you both for being with us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, if I may, we've been talking an awful lot about the uh, immigration uh, policy, the Rwanda deal. So I just wanted to kind of start off with that, if I may. Salma, it feels like this is a fight that the government is leaning into. Would that be fair? <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I think there are a couple of things. First of all, the Prime Minister made it very clear in January that this was one of the top priorities and this is what he needed to tackle. And so there's going to have to be some delivery on this. But more uh, fundamentally, I think, it sits in the public's consciousness about this idea that there is something that the country doesn't have control over. Um, and I think that it's, uh, it's, it's that that is essentially driving the fact that they need to make a big decision and, and a big push on the Rwanda policy in order to kind of in some ways, I hate to term it in this way, but have a victory on that. A victory is going to be harder, of course, uh, because, it, as you say, it depends on the delivery. Well, I mean, there's, there's so much to go through. It's, there's the, a, an appeal in the courts at the moment, and then also they're going to have to pass the legislation, which is not going to be an easy thing to do. And we have to stop the small boats, the podium, the, the, the slogan. I mean, it, it says pretty clearly what they want to do. Is it a difficult one for Labour, or do you think that actually this is, again, something that they're quite keen to have a dividing line on? Well, I think it's been interesting for Labour because immigration has often been quite a tricky issue for, for Labour in the past. But I think because the numbers have gone up so much under a Conservative administration, I think what the Labour Party is really sort of focusing on is the fact that the Conservatives will talk tough mm. on immigration. They've made it a priority for themselves. And yet the numbers go up and up and up. Mm. So their sort of their kind of focus is there's a big gap between the sort of politics and the, the rhetoric 
and the actual reality of the delivery. But I think what that signals is that the Conservatives have made a calculation that this is all about the optics. This is about having the row about immigration. Mm. But it's quite a dangerous game to play because if, look, we've got the local elections coming up very, very soon. And as we run into the general election, which is probably at least a minimum a year away, if those figures don't start coming down and there's no evidence they will, then the Conservatives could have ramped up this expectation and they will have failed to deliver on it. The only thing that I would say to that is that Labour is going to have to have a position on this. And I think as, as we get closer to the election, they are going to have to say, would they match the Conservative plans or would they do something different? But I think they have set out some policies. I mean, I think actually, I mean, indeed, the Labour Party's had some criticism from the left for being kind of a bit too sort of hardline on immigration. They have said, look, we have to get the, the boats down. This is, we have to have a sort of centre in France. We have to have much more money going into this. But I think that the, the big difference, I think, between the Labour stance and the Conservative stance is, unless you open up more safe and legal routes, people are still going to get in those boats. And I think, and also having no returns policy with France as well means it's quite hard to see how you actually stop these small boats. So I would say that, you know, Labour's actually, I think, being quite tough on immigration. There's plenty in within the party on the left who actually think, you know, we're not happy with the Labour Party and um, being tough on immigration. I think the Labour Party wants to be um, quite common sense on immigration, but have that level of compassion, particularly with these safe and legal routes. So it was actually quite interesting talking to the German ambassador uh, because obviously um, one of the ways for both Labour and the Conservatives is to set up these returns policies. Um, I think Labour are in exactly the same position as the Conservatives on it. And he was like, look, returns policy with the EU, that's not going to happen. Yeah. I thought it was quite clear, actually. Yeah, which um, is another, I'm afraid, uh, another bad result of where things are since we've left the, the EU. Um, I want to talk a bit about the SNP as well. I'll be honest, I'm going to level with you. It was slightly frustrating to have done the interview with Kate Forbes before this huge implosion uh, with the resignation of the uh, chief executive of the mm. Scottish National Party. But that is where we are. Um, what is actually going on with the SNP? What, I mean, it looks well, I, I'm, I'm going to look to Aisha here, <laughs> yeah. the resident yeah. expert on all yeah. things well, Scottish. Well, I, I, mean, I had a big discussion uh, yesterday, I'm not sure about this, and um, Chris Dewin, who writes The New Statesman, I think had a great way of, of, of phrasing it. He said that the resignation of Nicola Sturgeon is like a pin being pulled out mm. of grenade, and that's sort of how it feels for the, the SNP. It does feel like the party is going into this big implosion. And the st shock resignation of, of Peter Morell, who's the chief executive officer of the party, and also the husband of, of Nicola Sturgeon over sort of misinformation being given out about, about these figures and why that's important, as you've been sort of exploring, is that some of the candidates, particularly Ash Reagan, feel that they can't trust the process because they feel that the party machine is rigged for Hamza Yusuf in terms of being the can continuity candidate. But I think the bigger picture on all of this is that you do, you have seen the SNP, which has arguably been one of the most successful political projects mm. in the United Kingdom over the last two decades. Apart from getting independence itself. Yeah, but, but, but in terms of, you know, they've, they've dominated Scottish yes. politics. They've sort of wiped out the Labour Party and large parts of the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democrats. They've been very dominant in Scottish politics for sort of, li for, for sort of 15 years now. With Nicola Sturgeon going, it has been a bit of like watching a house of cards collapse. The big question is, is this going to benefit Labour come the next general mm. election? And the big elephant in the room is there's still no plan for independence because whoever wins the next general election, whether it's Rishi Sunak, whether it's Keir Starmer, they've said, no, we don't want to let you have independence. Um, as both of you are former advisers, I just wondered if, I, if you had like a pang of sympathy for um, the guy called Murray Foote, who was the head of communications for the SNP. He went out there basically saying facts about the SNP membership numbers that turned out to be incorrect. And he resigned, effectively saying that his people within the SNP had given him wrong information. Did you have a bit of sympathy? Because, you know, he went out there putting his uh, reputation on the line, if you like. I do have some sympathy in the sense that if he can't control the things that he's, you know, being given to say, then he shouldn't be the person who's on the chopping block. But this is this is the distinction between people who are actually decision makers and people mm. who are essentially advisers. And I think that perhaps that line was crossed with him having to resign over it because, you know, ultimately you're there to kind of deliver something. You're not there to sort of make the decision. And you've got to have trust in the people telling you what's going on. Exactly. Right? You have to have that level of. Also, I think what's interesting is that I think if if Murray had not resigned. I wonder if Peter Morrell would have 
clung on. And put that statement out. Yeah. Really saying yeah. very clearly, I'm resigning, but something's yeah. going on here. I think that was a big, big catalyst for, for, for this. And, you know, whatever wing of politics you're in, and certainly when I started as a junior press officer, the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries <laughs> and Food, literally <laughs> like centuries ago, I remember my first <laughs> day, it was like the olden days, like Jurassic Park, it was like... Really, you know, <laughs> But I do remember my chief press officer saying to me, and this is probably advice we've all had, which said, you know, if you don't know the answer to something, say you don't know the answer. What you should mm. not do is lie. lie. Yeah, yeah. Because it That's trashes true. your reputation, whether you're a press officer, whether you're an advisor, of course, and whether you're a minister. Yeah, you always remember it from the journalist's perspective yes, as well. Absolutely. You, if ever, everyone has told you an actual untruth, you're like... Yeah. Don't trust that person yeah. anymore. That's yeah. it. The line's being crossed. Um, Aisha touched on it about the electoral implications of the SNP uh, and the succession for Nicola Sturgeon. How concerned do you think the Conservatives are about it? Because, look, you mentioned the local elections and the general election next year. It's already a really thin landing zone for Rishi Sunak. And if Labour start picking up seats in Scotland, that's going to be even harder. I think it's always been uh, a difficult uh, question for the Conservatives, mm -hmm. that if Labour have a resurgence in Scotland, what does that mean for us nationally? And, you know, I don't think anybody's under uh, labouring under any pretense that this is going to be a really tough gig mm -hmm. for Rishi Sunak to try and sort of clamber back to an election victory. Um, but the SNP is facing the consequences of ha having had a strong leader for such a long time because essentially if, if there's one plant that grows really strong it sort of deprives the rest of sunlight. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to see actually how much uh, any of the candidates, whichever candidate comes through, is able to sort of galvanise the SNP against Labour. And again, whether the unionist, unionist cause is strengthened and whether the Conservatives can pick up from that. Mm. I don't think it's likely that Conservatives believe that there's going to be a big rush to them over there, but it, again, it's also not likely that there's going to be a huge rush to Labour. I think Keir Starmer has to do some work there as well. Mm. I, I'm not so sure about that. I, I think up until quite recently, I'd say a couple of weeks ago, Labour were thinking they'd be lucky if they maybe picked up about sort of 10 seats in Scotland. But I think with all the turmoil of Nicola Sturgeon going and the fact that she was such a sort of elite political athlete compared to mm. sort of what's on offer now, she was like such a fluent, strong, persuasive communicator. I don't think, you know, whoever follows her is going to be in that mould. I think Labour are now feeling much more confident about picking up more seats. I still think the SNP will be the dominant force. But remember, if there comes a point where Labour can, let's say, pick up an additional, let's say, 15, 20, that's quite a tipping point, which is very helpful for the calculus across the whole country in terms of taking Keir Starmer into Downing Street. And then if Keir Starmer does become Prime Minister, then he has a chance to show Scotland, look, this is how life could get better for you with a, a, a Labour administration. And then you could see mm. some inroads being made for, for the unionist cause under Labour. So you think there could be like a Labour SNP tie-in no. if the numbers don't go No, no, well. no. I think that basically, I think the fact that the SNP doing worse means that Keir Starmer will get a majority. Really interesting. Um, I'd love to have you both on again. It's been really fascinating to hear your talk. Before you go, uh, Oliver Dowden uh, said that Rishi Sunak respects Boris Johnson. Do you think that's right? I think, uh, yeah, I do, actually, yeah. because I, th I, I think that, you know, he delivered Brexit, Rishi Sunak was a Brexiteer, I think there was definitely, you know, this fight, Boris Johnson is this big character. I don't, I don't think that there's um, any way that that wasn't true. But it's interesting he's given everybody a free vote. Yeah, that is. Exactly. I mean, that, that, that you tells can, us a lot. You can respect him and not want to, <laughs> not want to facilitate his demise yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that is going to it's going to be fiery next week. It really uh, is. Uh, thank you both very much for being uh, on the program uh, this morning. That is it for this week's uh, Safer Ridge on Sunday. But in a moment after the break, we're going to be running through today's interviews and seeing what we learned with our deputy political editor Sam Coates. Thanks for joining us this Sunday.
Hello, welcome back. You're watching Sophie Ridge on Sunday. The Take, a chance to look back at our interviews this morning on the programme, try and work out what we learned, what it means for the week ahead. It was one of these mornings where, you know, I had a list of potential topics to talk to Oliver Dowden about. Uh, was it going to be strikes? Was it going to be immigration? Was it going to be Brexit? Was it going to be Boris Johnson? Uh, and I had to really try and whittle it down. The budget, another thing I almost forgot there. Uh, but it did feel this morning I was keen to really try and talk to him about uh, what he makes uh, of the Rwanda policy. One of the key dividing lines uh, in politics, one of those things where you're seeing very different positions from the government and the Labour Party on. And also to talk a bit about the, uh, the language, because obviously that's something that has really come under uh, scrutiny uh, as well in recent weeks. The Home Secretary claimed that billions of people could potentially hope to come to the United Kingdom. Let's have a little listen to how he responded and then we can talk to Sam Coates off the back. Well, it, it is a, a function of the global economy and differences in levels of development that countries like the United Kingdom, France, Germany, United States and others have potentially vast numbers of people who wish to come here as economic migrants. Billions, secondly, billions of secondly, if you'll let me finish this point, secondly, it is the case that if you look at the numbers, we, we were at uh, a situation where there were dozens of boats three or four years ago. We're at 40,000 uh, last year, projected to rise further. We have to be willing to put a stop to this. And there are very, very large numbers of people who could potentially wish to enter the United Kingdom and indeed other developed countries uh, for, for economic migration reasons. Well, I'm very pleased to say that, as usual, we're joined by our Deputy Political Editor, uh, Sam Coates. Great to have you uh, on the programme, as usual, this morning, uh, Sam. What do you make of the Rwanda policy? Um, do you think that the government feels that actually, look, this is something that's going to appeal to voters, that it's in a winning position, that's why they're leaning in? Or actually, do you think there are some issues that are going to cause some problems? Well, Sophie, the reason we're talking about the Rwanda policy is because Suella Braverman has been there. She took GB News and The Telegraph uh, to go and see where migrants, uh, asylum seekers uh, who failed in their claims would go back to. So the government wants to talk about this. Rishi Sunak wants to talk about it. And we've been talking about it for a couple of weeks because of the Gary Lineker affair. Uh, and before that was the weekend before the whole policy was launched. So there is some confidence, I think, in government that this is a politically sensible terrain for them to go on. But uh, just in the last half an hour, I've been just running through some of the numbers because while Rishi Sunak was off in San Diego on Monday, you had the first vote on this. Uh, and an extraordinary high number of Tory MPs just declined to back the government's own Rwanda policy and the associated asylum legislation. 45 MPs abstained or weren't there or didn't turn up uh, from that vote, which is an awfully high number for a government uh, that has a majority of just 66, once you take into account uh, all of the MPs that aren't there. In other words, the government is very confident about the politics of this, looking tough on an issue that people care about. But I think the big question here is whether or not this ends up happening and if this all comes crashing down in legislative flames, whether or not the government ends up just looking a little bit incompetent, incompetent, having not managed its own side properly. I mentioned before Theresa May is one of the chief critics of Rishi Sunak's policy. She just doesn't think it's going to deal with that many people. Most of the uh, people who are here as uh, in the country unnecessarily are overstayers on their visas. So she thinks that it's the wrong target. She thinks that uh, it would undermine some of the modern slavery commitments that she as Prime Minister did. She's joined in the criticism of this by Caroline Noakes. She's the chairman of the Women and uh, Equality Select Committee. So there is a ban of MPs who, in a couple of weeks' time, probably about 10 days, when this legislation comes back, uh, are probably going to go up a gear in their criticism. And we might then find that we move from a situation where the government were on comfortable sort of TV talking points, uh, and that moves away to actually quite tricky, quite sticky implementation. Because even if this gets through the Commons and the Lords, even then it's unclear where uh, various uh, attempted refugees uh, are held, uh, what are the asylum centres. There's just a plethora of practical problems. That means from where I sit, it's far from clear that this is going to be still looking like a success in nine months' time. That's really interesting. That does seem, as you say, Sam, a very high number of Conservative MPs um, not backing the policy. Look, they might have different reasons for it, of course, some of the individuals, but that does seem 
a bit of an outlier, doesn't it, uh, in terms of what you would uh, expect. Uh, Sam, they're talking a bit about the implementation uh, as well, about how uh, easy it will be to fulfil that pledge to stop the boats. And I just want to bring you in uh, the Labour interview and then talk to Sam off the back of that, because we also spoke to the Shadow Leveling Up Secretary, Lisa Nandy, and touched on Suella Braverman's use of language. Let's have a listen. What people say Gary Lineker said is very different from what Gary Lineker actually said. The government has been keen to say that he was likening this to the Nazis, that he wasn't, and I would have utterly condemned that had he done so. I don't think he would have done so, frankly. What he was pointing to was a chilling comparison uh, with an environment in which people aren't free to be able to challenge this sort of language and behaviour. Don't forget it was Suella Braverman who used really inhumane language about the migrant crisis, which was roundly condemned, not just by people outside of politics, but by people across the political spectrum, including some of her own colleagues. Right, let's bring Sam back in, uh, shall we? We're really in culture war territory again here, aren't we? Uh, absolutely. And it's interesting. Uh, the Labour Party have decided to effectively, in, and you heard that from uh, uh, the way Lisa and Andy was talking and other front benches have been talking, to side uh, with Gary Lineker, uh, the BBC presenter, briefly suspended uh, for his social media remarks about the government's Rwanda policy um, because they think that that's a winning position. And there is some polling to suggest the public oppose the suspension of Gary Lineker, albeit briefly, from uh, the BBC Match the Day programme. But, but what this also does, I think, and this is the game of, uh, uh, of, of Tory strategists, is it highlights uh, what they think is a uh, Labour weakness on the issue of migration. And listening particularly to Keir Starmer and a bit there to, to Lisa Nandy, what they also like to talk in, uh, uh, in broad terms about the implementation issues rather than the issues of principle. When, when you hear Rishi Sunak versus Keir Starmer in the Commons, Rishi Sunak always emphasises the points of principle principle and policy, and Keir Starmer always emphasises the, the, the fact that he, he thinks there are many, many practical problems and the government had tried this before and it never really works and it's not going to do anything, uh, and, and, it, and, and, and sort of shies away from putting himself in a position that doesn't also look tough, because I think there is a dilemma uh, for Labour, the party previously of free movement that's now junked that to tr try and reinforce that impression in people's minds against a Conservative party that are trying to claim that Labour never changes its mind. Uh, uh, on, on, and will always be the party uh, of free migration, which you know Labour would say is absolutely not true. But they've got to hammer that through, uh, hammer that point through to the government, and it is just politically tricky. That's why we're having this discussion because not only would Rishi Sunak say it's right, but they also spy it might just give them some electoral advantage. And there's just the t tiniest sign. In, uh, in some polling work done, uh, that questions around what exactly Labour's immigration policy is is starting to raise up uh, uh, the list of questions people have for Keir Starmer. And Sam, I know that's something you and I are always really keen to focus on is strikes, because we're aware, of course, as many people are, that how much of our viewers and everyone's lives these are really impacting strikes right across the public sector. So I just want to play you what Oliver Dowden uh, said when I spoke to him uh, about the NHS strikes uh, in particular and how the pay rise that has been agreed and is being put to members, how that's going to be funded. First of all, it doesn't necessarily have to come uh, within the, uh, the envelope for the, the NHS of the 160 a billion pounds as the wider Department of Health budget and there's the wider budget across all of government. Even within the 160 billion for the NHS, not all of that is going to be for frontline uh, services. So the frontline services we think about are, of course, your hospitals, your doctor's surgeries and so on. Within a budget that large, the, it is, there is potential to get efficiencies. And of course, many of the public sector workers uh, going on uh, strike include the civil service, the PCS union. Let's listen to the other side of the argument, shall we? This is Mark Sawatka, its general secretary. I have to say I find it extraordinary that the minister for the cabinet office that you interviewed earlier on did not even mention that 135,000 of his staff were on strike earlier this week, 110,000 of his staff were on strike on the 1st of February, and he's going to have 1,500 of his staff in every passport office in the UK out for a five-week strike starting in two weeks' time. I think it goes to confirm the utter contempt they hold their own workforce in, and that's why we're on strike. 
Right, let's bring in uh, Sam again. I think it's really important, actually, to focus on the fact that this is not additional money that the government is going to give. This is money that is going to be, have to be found, presumably, from the NHS budget, even if it's not the front line of the NHS, NHS budget, if I can actually get my words out, um, from that budget all the same. That's right, Sophie. Uh, can I confess to being pretty flabbergasted? Um, the Conservative argument around public sector pay has always been we've got to manage the economy properly. We don't want to push up inflation. We want to know how we're going to pay for pay rises. And what Oliver Dowden did was come on your show and say, there's great news, we've done a deal with the nurses to give them a, effectively 5%, and we don't know how we're going to pay for it. It might come from the NHS bu budget, the non-frontline bit. It might come from uh, other bits of the health budget that doesn't include the NHS, or it might come from, 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 from somewhere else. They just don't know. And, and that feels odd. And, and if I'm being honest, Sophie, it doesn't feel true. I, 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 don't, I don't believe they don't know where the money's coming from, so I, I think that's a lie. So let, let, let's... Uh, 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 so I find that a complicated answer that I'm, I'm uncomfortable with because, of course, they have an idea where this money's coming from and they're just not being honest about it. But, it, but, but he did say, Oliver Dadden did say, it might come from the non-frontline bits of the NHS budget. Now, back in 2021, when they did the kind of, as it were, the spending settlement, the spending review settlement for the NHS, at that point, they asked the NHS specifically for £12 billion of efficiencies, right? So the NHS is already finding money from its own budget. And then last autumn, they had to give them NHS more money because it couldn't keep up with inflation. And now potentially as a result of the nurses deal, they're going to whack maybe the NHS budget, the non-frontline bit, with, you know, another £1.5 billion to, to, to find to pay the pay deals, which is going to have to go on reducing headcount or maybe uh, stopping some of those sort of digital uh, future proofing for the NHS. Uh, I mean, it's all just very, very bizarre. But I just think the, the idea that it is a possibility, according to ministers, that the NHS gets less money uh, for, for some kinds of uh, services, not frontline ones, but some of the things, some of its operations, so that it could fund this pay rise that it was so resistant to for quite a long time. It, it, I mean, it just hurts your head. Yeah, it does. And also, like you say, like, OK, there's frontline NHS services, but that doesn't mean that the other parts of the NHS don't directly support those frontline services. It feels to me like it's not an easy distinction that you can just draw. Oh, this is the important part of the NHS budget, and actually none of this affects patient care, when, of course, it feels much more complicated than that. Um, Sam, while I've got you, I really want to talk to you about next week, because Boris Johnson, of course, is going to be up in front of the Privileges uh, Committee. It's going to be a big moment, uh, whether or not... They're going to rule, of course, on whether or not he misled Parliament over Partygate. And I think it was pretty clear from Oliver Dowden this morning that MPs are going to get a free vote on that. What do you think that's going to mean? Oh, it's going to be a blockbuster uh, week or two in the House of Commons. I'm very sad uh, to be out of the game for the next two weeks and about to miss it. Uh, but Wednesday, I think, is going to be the most uh, explosive day in British politics because there are two things going on. There is uh, Rishi Sunak pushing through the Brexit deal that Boris Johnson opposes, the Windsor framework. And then at the same time, there's going to be uh, four to six hours of testimony from Boris Johnson about whether or not he lied in Partygate uh, that will essentially inform a select committee that's got to decide whether whether it thinks that Boris Johnson lied to Parliament. And if they think that he did, then there's going to be a vote, a free vote in the House of Commons that could determine whether or not Boris Johnson is suspended, could face a by-election and could be slung out of politics altogether. So how Boris Johnson handles himself on Wednesday is going to be fascinating. I think that the key point to remember is that Boris Johnson is effectively trying to prove that he was told that uh, everything he said that uh, to the Commons uh, was uh, was true, that he wasn't breaking the law uh, by what was going on inside Downing Street. Now, we've seen from uh, evidence and testimony re re already released by that committee that they are minded to condemning the evidence put forward by the Privileges Committee. Uh, paints a pretty damning p uh, picture of Boris Johnson. They say he was attended parties, he could see parties from his own front door uh, within Downing Street. Uh, they say that he knew what was going on, he was intimately involved with some of the... Um, uh, with, with some of the conversations. They also question, they also clearly, the Privileges Committee, have had uh, private conversations with aides that have been pretty damning. It's still got the capacity to get very, very ugly. It's going to be an extraordinary day. 